So, hi, good evening everyone. I'm very, very happy to welcome you all here in the cinema of the DFF, the German Film Institute and Film Museum. I have to admit I'm also a little bit sad because today is the last event on our lecture and film series dedicated to Chantal Ackermann. It has been really uh, an amazing uh, nine months that we have been watching so many of her films and discussing with scholars, specialists, uh, friends and collaborators of hers. And um, for those who have followed the program, I can, uh, if you feel like me, uh, it's kind of sad to come to an end. Um, but this has definitely been a very, very productive series. I'm very happy about it. All in all, for those of you who missed one or the other lecture, uh, we have all of them recorded and you can watch in our YouTube channel of the DFF or in our website. You can click uh, www.chantal-ackermann.de and there you will find all the lectures and the videos and you can check out everything we have been doing here for the past nine months. I would also like to use the chance to thank um, everybody that has been following the series for all this time. And of course, um, I have to, 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 thanks, um, to thank first and foremost uh, Professor Vincent Schrediger and the Institute for Theater, Film and Media of the Goethe University, because this has been really an amazing um, collaboration with, be, between us and, them, and the university. And uh, we're hoping to keep doing this uh, program for a long time. And of course, I would like to thank all of our other partners, uh, the Excellence Cluster and Normative Orders, thanks to whom we managed to offer this uh, reduced entrance fee for this, uh, for this lecture series. Of course, the Hessen Film and Medien Academy, the Friends of the Goethe University, and the City of Frankfurt, who all have collaborated to this program. Um, today is the last lecture, like I said, but we do have one more um, film screening on the 20th of July. That's one of the accompanying programs, the Begleit program. We're showing, um, we decided that we had to show at some point the first short film that Chantal Ackermann uh, did, uh, Sot Ma Ville, Blow Up My Town. Um, today we're screening her uh, last film. We're going to screen her first film also in the same month, so it's going to be kind of a clash, but I think it's uh, an important film to for those who don't know it yet to have seen it. So uh, on the 20th of July, we're going to screen that film, and then we decided to also screen another film where Chantal Ackermann is, um, well, in the camera, so it's a... An interview with her, done by a Brazilian filmmaker. Um, it's called Chantal Ackerman GK, Chantal Ackerman from here. It's an interview that she um, gave in Brazil in 2010, and that's going to be also then um, screened together with her first short film. And for those of you who were here two weeks ago, uh, Professor Martin Zell referred to this documentary a lot and some of the things that Chantal Ackerman talks about in her in this interview. So I also um, warmly recommend to you to check out our program program and to come back on the 20th of July for this screening. Um, so tonight uh, we have the big honor to receive Dieter Rostrate, who is going to talk to us about um, No Home Movie by Chantal Ackermann. And now I would like to invite Professor Vincent Rediger to um, introduce us to our tonight's speaker. And just as a reminder, uh, after the lecture we have a 10-15 minute break. You can um, get drinks up in the bar and have a little um, break before we start with the screening of the film. And after the film we have the Q&A, so you have the chance to ask questions uh, about the lecture, about the film, about Chantal Ackermann in general. So please stick around and have a nice evening. Thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I also want to add a thanks to the list uh, of thanks. Uh, I want to thank the audience uh, for turning out so reliably and loyally and uh, making this series the success it has been, at least for me and I think for Laura and for a few other people as well. Uh, it's something that, that I like to tell people when we tell them about the work that we do with the film museum, with this lecture, film and lecture series, lecture and film series. Uh, I always tell people, uh, you know, Frankfurt is a place where you can do that because we have the right audience. Um, and I just want to Make sure you heard that here. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the image. It's a wonderful picture to start this evening with. Uh, as I, I want to echo Laura's sentiment that uh, this is a series that could actually start all over again at the beginning. Um, we could do another year and basically watch the same films again and 
have some of the same people back because they have a lot more to say. Uh, which is another way of saying that, that Jean-Paul Ackermann really is an inexhaustible subject, topic, filmmaker. Uh, one of, you know, I'm not an art historian, so I'm unqualified to say this, but one of the great artists of the second half of the 20th century in any discipline. Um, one of the people who helped uh, make Chantal Ackermann the great visual artist that she also was, or that she ultimately became, is our guest tonight, Daniel, um, <clears throat> Daniel Rustraute, who is a curator and a philosopher and an author. And when we started setting up um, uh, this event, um, Dieter said, why don't we, and it was already clear that he would have the closing slot, he said, why don't we pick No Home Movie for this, which also happens to be uh, Chantal Lacrimon's final film. So uh, just in terms of the, the drama, dramatic arch of the whole series, this really is the finale in, in more ways than one. Um, as you could see from Dieter's uh, title, um, what you could call the nomadic lifestyle of Chantal Ackermann is at stake here in this film and uh, in the talk. Uh, Chantal Ackermann, as we've learned, if we didn't already know, is someone who lived in several places, many places, but always remained very strongly attached to her hometown of Brussels and to the figure of her mother, who is the protagonist of the film that we're going to see um, tonight. Um, our speaker tonight, in a way, shares that, shares some of the traits of that biography with uh, Chantal Ackermann. Uh, in preparation for this evening, I uh, read an interview with Dieter in a high-end uh, uh, architecture theory journal where he talked about uh, an exhibition he'd curated for the Prada Foundation in Venice for the Architectural Biennale. And there was this little biographical note, and I'm going to read the first sentence to you, first in German, I'm going to translate it. Als Co-Curator der Documenta 14 musste Dieter Rolstraute zwei Jahre in Kassel leben. Jetzt wohnt er in Chicago, wo er am Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society kuratiert. So as Frankfurt, as we know how hard it is to live in Kassel, and we can understand that. Um, but uh, what it tells you is that, uh, you know, he's someone who's lived in many places and done work uh, in various parts of the world. And he actually assured me uh, just now that uh, it was his choice to go to Kassel instead of Athens. He had, cho he had a choice of going to Athens and Kassel, and he said he was not interested in fighting the... Uh, local wars of the Athens art scene and actually had a great time in uh, Kossel instead. So, you know, Hessen, not so bad after all. Um, uh, Dieter is originally from Belgium and he uh, got his first degree in philosophy at the University of Ghent and was on course to uh, doing a PhD in philosophy but then discovered that he was actually more interested in film theory at the time and particularly the visual arts and writing about arts. And that's how he uh, weird off or found his way into the art world and the career of curating. And as I already read from the little bit here, uh, he is now the uh, curator of the Neubauer Institute, uh, the Neubauer Collegium at the um, University of Chicago, American universities, tend to have their own art museums, the high-end universities at least, art museums, art institutions. And this is a contemporary art space uh, in, in, uh, which, uh, for which uh, Dieter works as a curator, but he also teaches at the University of Chicago, so he's both a curator and he um, uh, is an academic and a teacher. And he has a very long and intensive and productive uh, history of working with Chantal Ackermann, which he will tell us about now. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation and for coming to Frankfurt, Dieter. Um, thanks for the um, invitation, Vincent, uh, Laura, the introduction. <clears throat> um, very generous words. Um, yes. I believe some of the uh, um, uh, sizable part of my audience is students from the Städelschule. Is that correct? 
I don't see a single hand raised. Just the one, a couple, <laughs> right? Yes. Well, to them, if they're interested, uh, tomorrow I'll be at the Stadel Schule to talk about um, my reasons for opting to work and live in Kassel as opposed to um, uh, Athens. But it is true that uh, um, art requires the, the cruelest of sacrifices. Um, so, um, um, just out of curiosity, I would like to know who other than the organizers has uh, witnessed the majority of the program. Have uh, most people here? There's one very resolute arm. <laughs> So quite a few. Um, I mean, those people are, of course, warn that we will be walking down uh, the well-trodden path of what my predecessors have said. Um, and, um, and the way I kind of wanted to uh, proceed today is, um, um, you know, I'll introduce this last film, um, this, this kind of epitaph in a way, this tombstone. <clears throat> And, um, and leading up to it, I'll just kind of go through um, the standard chronology of, of uh, Chantal's um, filmography and kind of use that, the story of that chronology um, as a prism to look at what I think are some of the kind of the core concerns of her work in, as a whole, which in a way culminate in the, in the masterpiece of this particular, um, of this particular film. Um, Another question is, who has seen No Home Movie? <laughs> Only the organizers. Um, uh, yeah, good. Um, it's required viewing, though not necessarily pleasurable, if you know what I mean. Uh, there's kind of a, well, there's a great deal of masochism involved, I think, in, in, in enjoying uh, Chantal Ackerman, and she really kind of um, <clears throat> drove that point home in this particular movie. Um, which you know is a uh, makes for harrowing viewing. I'm just making sure that after uh, the break, everyone will come back to <laughs> to be like, okay, what's you know, because really it's, it's something else. Um, anyway, it's of course a great honor to stand here. Um, it's a great honor to have been invited uh, to Frankfurt to uh, talk on the occasion of this. Of this uh, festival, and of course, the greatest honor uh, has been that of working with uh, um, Chantal Ackerman, who I, you know, have the pleasure, in a way, of being able to refer to, um, not only in the present tense, but also in, uh, you know, kind of on a first name basis, uh, which is a very un-German um, tradition, obviously. Um, it's also, you know, a great honor to uh, be part of this uh, of this this uh, impressive Hamlet of theorists and, 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 and film enthusiasts and curators who have all um, stood here before me and, as I mentioned, probably uh, have said things that I'll just kind of repeat. <clears throat> um, I have not, you know, uh, been able to kind of really assess the, the content of their uh, presentations, but I understand that, you know, some of them being scholars will have read papers, some of them... Um, uh, people who work very closely with Chantal will have spoken on a very kind of personal level, and then finally, some of them having been, some some of them being curators, uh, just kind of get away with uh, you know babbling on in a way. Uh, it's a very important requirement of the curatorial trade uh, to just kind of keep speaking. <coughs> <laughs> um, and I, I should also warn. Um, this is a good trick to always warn uh, people come back. Um, but yes, I, I, I don't have so much, uh, I don't think I have a lot of original things to say about uh, uh, Chantal's work or about this particular film that really speaks uh, um, for itself and I kind of make up for the lack of originality and also the, the lack of really kind of discursive rigor <clears throat> by, you know, being able to refer to the fact that I had the um, honor of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, kind of this very direct working experience with this, uh, you know, amazing artist. I, I, there's no other way uh, to really put it. And, you know, if this is a beautiful image, um, it's mostly um, because she was uh, or is, in a way, a beautiful person. I mean, it's, uh, you know, on, on, on every uh, single level in a way. And, um, and, of course, you know, she's smoking in bed. It's the worst thing you could do. Um, I'm staying at a hotel that's very adamant about the fact that you can't smoke in a room, but then inside the room there's actually a note that says, do not ever smoke in bed, <clears throat> which of course uh, Chantal uh, did until the very end. Um, so, so I'll talk really on a personal level, because in a way, um, 
the art of Chantal Ackermann is so deeply personal that you know it's the most authentic way to speak about it as, as this very personal testimony and testament, which you know sometimes of course can veer um, on the edge of gossip, uh, which I will also provide perhaps. Um, she herself really loved um, gossiping. Um, Um, maybe a couple of, uh, yeah, and I, 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 I brought along my slideshow, um, I like to speak to images, <clears throat> images uh, interrogate me and, and kind of, you know, um, kind of loosen me up in a way. Um, so the reason why I'm here um, is very simply the fact that in, back in 2012, um, I curated a, a fairly a substantial survey show of um, Chantal Ackermann's work as a visual artist, first and foremost, as a video artist, as an installation artist. Um, this exhibition was called Too Far Too Close, and it was organized at the uh, Antwerp Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, MUCA, which was my institutional home at the time. Um, I worked at this museum from 2004 until um, late 2011, 2000, early 2012, and then actually moved um, to Chicago in 2012 to take up another curatorial position at the Museum of Contemporary Art, the MCA Chicago. Um, so um, organizing this big um, exhibition together with Chantal was my farewell um, to Antwerp. It's the last uh, big show that I organized there. And uh, for that reason uh, as well, it was you know, very kind of... Uh, emotionally charged for myself. I still remember um, having trouble kind of keeping my <clears throat> stoic cool at the opening, uh, during the opening speech. And um, in fact, one of the things, uh, one, of the, one of my uh, fondest memories of working with Chantal on that show and, uh, was the fact that she would uh, always smoke inside the museum, um, which is of course verboten. Um, the director, who himself was a very devout smoker for a long time, would always kind of, you know, storm down the stairs to make sure that he extinguished her cigarette before um, the alarm would trigger. But she would very kind of, you know, very tauntingly light another one. Um, half of the show, did, um, has anyone, out of curiosity, do, do people know uh, the museum in Antwerp? Have people been there? A couple of hands. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it covered a large surface, um, 1,500 square meters worth of uh, Jean de Lackenman. Half of it was carpeted, which of course means that, you know, not terribly interesting to smoke in. Um, but she smoked also at the opening, which I don't think anyone had done in 20 years. Um, and the cigarette really is a meaningful object in her work. Um, there's one film, uh, we'll, 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 I'll call up a still of that film that basically, it, consists of nothing other than women smoking uh, because smoking of course and I remember writing about smoking in conjunction with Chantal's show um, <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, I'm not a smoker myself but I did have to do it uh, back then to kind of better understand the mystique and I timed uh, my smoking sessions and you know Kind of the, the medium length of any kind of cigarette session, as most of you who smoke will know, is seven minutes and 30 seconds. Um, which is kind of like double an old film loop, I think. Um, I'm not saying that there's a, a relationship between smoking and, and cinema, though perhaps there might be. Um, there's certainly an interesting uh, parallel to be drawn between this idea of smoke and, you know, evanescence and, you know, ephemerality and... and uh, and you know the art of film, of course, right? And, and the specter always of the of the old, of you know, kind of analog film burning before our very eyes, um, which is uh, uh, a tactic, uh, like a formal tactic that um, Chantal actually also experimented with. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I um, I invited. Or I first kind of had this idea about this uh, survey show sometime in 2010, so kind of two years out. Uh, and I didn't really know Chantal Ackermann personally, um, some friends in common. Um, 
I also wasn't a great connoisseur of her f of her work as a filmmaker. I was very well aware of her work in installation uh, art and video art, and that was basically kind of the, the 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 ground of my interest. And this was the reason also why I extended the invitation to her to uh, be the subject of this of this um, of this survey exhibition. Which you know, um, she was sixty at the time, and. Um, a six-year-old artist, a six-year-old artist, should be kind of resistant to the idea of a of a survey, of course, because of the implied um, uh, suspicion of mortality or something. Um, <clears throat> so you know, she was um, easily seduced, but not uh, necessarily easily convinced uh, of the rationale of doing um, this project and. Um, and working with her was also, and I, you know, I'm happy to be uh, honest about this and transparent and candid and on camera as well. Um, working with her was uh, very challenging at times, very difficult. She could be a real piece of work, as anyone who's really spent some time with her films obviously would know. Um, well, are there any friends of Chantal in the audience? Like personal, are there any kind of personal connections? I'm, I'm being looked at. Um... <laughs> So, and, and this is, you know, again, it's, it's um, just personal anecdote, but kind of interesting to consider. Um, prior to doing this exhibition, which was initiated in 2010 and opened in early 2012, uh, prior to this exhibition, I had actually hardly any experience uh, curating monographic exhibitions at all. Um, up to that point, I had been working primarily as a curator of group shows, which, you know, after that, I was also, I continued to be more than anything else. As a curator, um, my program, in a way, is that, is the idea of the, of the or is the notion of the idea-based group show. Um, and in a way, she was the first exception. Um, the first time I, I, I kind of launched into this, onto this uh, monographic territory, which was, uh, uh, frankly, incredibly uh, an incredible terror at times. Um, anyone in the audience who works in the curatorial field will, of course, know that to curate a solo show is much more traumatizing than to curate a group show uh, because of the um, necessary intimacy that you engage uh, the artist with, in a way. <clears throat> and an artist like Chantal Ackermann, whose entire work revolves around, you know, the push and pull of intimacy and, and, and alienation, um, you know, working with her was all the more visceral in many ways. And, you know, her cinema is, of course, one of visceral instincts, even though it's so often so stoic and so rigid and clinical in its execution. Um, but this, you know, v this viscerality is something that certainly plays in, in, in the movie that we're going to see tonight. Um, the film. I don't think it's a movie, it's a film. It's no home movie. Um... And and this is um, a still from No Home Movie, and you know perhaps one of the images that is most widely circulated to um, promote it. It's, a, it's an image of her mother, who is the central feature, uh, the central figure in No Home Movie from 2015, <clears throat> and. Um, and this is a, uh, shown in her kitchen in Brussels, which is a place that I spend a lot of time in. Um, I was working, I was living in Brussels at the time. I was working in the museum in Antwerp. Uh, Chantal, of course, had been living in Paris for a very long time. Um, her mother was still living in Brussels. And she spent, uh, as we all know by this point, uh, uh, sp spent a lot of time um, with her mother, <clears throat> especially after her father's passing uh, a decade or so um, before that, then her mother's apartment in a leafy suburb of Brussels became a little bit our working quarters. It's where I would most uh, uh, frequently meet her. Uh, I only really made it to Paris once or twice to uh, meet her, but we'd meet in Brussels very often, and we'd always meet in her mother's house in 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 uh, in more typically the kitchen, in fact, which is you know the central uh, the locus in a way of this image and the and, and the movie as a as a whole um so so kind of a, a um a, a, an at times painful process of collaborating um with a genius artist uh, but someone who already then i could feel you know <laughs> is just plainly a tortured soul um <clears throat> 
and you know who's who also kind of wore the emblem of this torment on her sleeve as a filmmaker and so this is of course the point where i once again should uh, uh stress that uh, this is not an easy this does not make for easy viewing um it's a it's a hard one um so I was surprised to hear Soltma, Soltma Ville has not been seen here. Um, yes, I mean, this is, of course, a film that many people in the audience may be familiar with. It's, it's uh, Chantal's uh, debut. You know, San, Chantal Ackermann was born in Brussels in 1950. Um, her first um, uh, proper film uh, was made in 1968. She was 18 years old. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, Picasso in his pink period or blue period. Um, artists really matured fast back in the day. She was 18 at the time. Um, this is a short uh, film. It's all, you know, 10 or 12 minutes or something like that. It's an absolute masterpiece. Um, <clears throat> just cl kind of clearly paved the way for her, you know, for the, for, you know, establishing her name as, 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 a, as, a, as a completely original uh, pioneering voice in the film field. Uh, um, and of course, um, it's shot entirely in her mother's, in her parents' kitchen. Not the same one, but uh, uh, again, so, you know, of course, the pairing of these images is built around that um, reflection, right? This is a film from 2015. This is a film from 1968. So what does that mean? Is that what, 47 years apart? Yes. So, you know, it took 47 years for her to close the circle of this uh, uh, fascination with the, you know, kind of the, the arch interiority of the kitchen um so if that's what you're being treated to next then um i, I can only uh, be jealous of that you know marvel um so that's 1962 um oh no sorry 1968 uh so you know just a little bit of biography again uh you know um I'll be repeating whatever has come before me. Uh, but shortly after finishing making that film in 1968, she uh, um, broke away to New York. Uh, you know, she was in her early 20s. She was 21 when she decided to move to New York. Um, this, you know, 1971, when New York was kind of, in a way, the capital of a certain mythology, really. <clears throat> and um, this is the first... Um, film does, that she that she shot in uh, New York, which is called La Chambre. It's from 1972. It's basically a very, um, you know, kind of formal exercise. It's this 180 degree panoramic shot of a room that she basically inhabits in New York. Um, you know, kind of a direct continuation of this preoccupation, this formal preoccupation with, you know, the with, with this kind of interiority, right? Um, also note how, once again, she's in bed. Um, beds and kitchens. It's basically, you know, those are the uh, the primary sites of of cinematic conception and creation in in, in Chantal's world. Um, in you know all of the um, gender implications that are suggested in it, obviously, right? Um, and so that image that uh, still from La Chambre, the film from 1972, uh, was on the cover of the uh, book that was. Uh, published on the occasion of that exhibition, which I curated in 2012 in Antwerp, early 2012, too far, too close. Um, <clears throat> and that film really, um, you know, in 68, she, she, she makes uh, Salt Maville and then kind of the first uh, major cinematic um, undertaking after that is La Chambre, which is, a, you know, kind of a formal experiment in which she, you know, for the first time really kind of tries to uh, feel out the porous borders of the film medium as, as you know, a potential site for the spatial, in, uh, for the spatial experience of an artwork, right? Of a, of a, of a three-dimensional artwork. And, um, and this, this title, Too Far, Too Close, is, is one that she came up with. Um, and in many ways, it sounds a little bit like a, I mean, a manifesto, is the wrong word because it's too kind of politically tainted or too politically colored and in many ways Chantal Ackermann is kind of like a para-political artist or a post-political artist or meta-political artist. Uh, 
Um, she didn't have a lot of time for politics, strangely enough. And I know that this is the kind of statement that will um, get you stick around for the Q&A session afterwards. Um, but, you know, she's... Um, there's like a sense in her work that the personal is the personal and not necessarily the political, even though we all know that the personal is the political. Um, <clears throat> so not a not a manifesto, but maybe a motto or kind of like a like a, like an, an adage, like an adagio, um, which you know is just kind of completely emblematic of her lifelong cultivation of ambiguity. And ambivalence and 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 kind of doubling and and you know a refusal to be pinned down to being one particular person, but also a an inability to be pinned down, which is exactly in a way what I kind of experienced when I was working on this exhibition with her, uh, because the premise of the show was to kind of celebrate the visual artist, um, not ne not forget the filmmaker because she's also also always that, but to kind of celebrate her achievement in the visual art field. Um, and and um, and the ambivalence that is is kind of given in the under in can, the very premise of that exhibition was something that you know was partly productive of this tension that you know she brought on working in the project. Um, and here's a funny thing <clears throat> about that show: I uh, can't find installation shots anywhere. Um, I mean, that's an installation shot for the exhibition in Antwerp to the left. Uh, I'm not terribly good at archiving my own career. Um, I don't have a single installation shot of any of the exhibitions I curated in, in Antwerp, even though I worked there for, you know, seven or eight years. And it's hard to find any visual um, evidence of what that show looked like online, uh, which is a little bit um, kind of... Uh, frustrating and um, um, anyway so these are two examples of what uh, of work um, in the show and, and gives you a little bit of a sense of what that um, looked like so kind of in a way the, you know 180 degree opposite of the experience that we're having here where we're all sitting in chairs and looking at the screen right um, you know this in a way was a was a, a highlighting of the work that she's done in kind of challenging the spatial doxa of the cinematic experience by producing work that had to be walked in, walked past, walked through, um, or otherwise kind of, ex you know, experienced as, a, as, a, as, an, immersive, uh, as an immersive event. Um, the work on the right you will probably know or probably recognize that's um, kind of an installation shot of Dest, the film that she made in 1993, which was then afterwards kind of translated into uh, an installation for an exhibition that she was invited to um, do in Brussels, I believe. And it was actually her first foray into, um, into installation art, into kind of like video art. And this happened in the early 90s. And... Um, I don't know this uh, documentary. I'm not sure if people here have seen it. I would imagine that the Ackermann acolytes have. Um, I haven't seen it. Um, but the title, of course, again, kind of speaks volumes. Uh, I don't belong anywhere is basically, you know, it's probably, I haven't visited her grave, but maybe it's what's on there. Um, it's may, you know, might be the one phrase you'll find on her gravestone. <laughs> Of course, you know, a truly rootless, homeless person wouldn't have a grave, so perhaps she doesn't have a gravestone. That would only be fitting. Um, I should look that up. Um, but anyway, I don't belong anywhere. I don't belong in your museum. I don't belong in your cinema. Um, I don't, belove, uh, I don't belo belong in, in, in film culture. I don't belong in the contemporary art world. Um, that certainly was a sensation that, we, that I was interested in exploring as a curator and that was also brought out in working with her. Um, and um, and and you know, kind of the main point that I want to make today about uh, that's kind of hinted at in the title, um, you know, the uh, the wandering Jewess, right? The the uh, the what's the what what would the German be? The wander the wanderende Juden, glaube ich, yeah. Um, Chantal Ackermann. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's a wandering that is that starts from it starts at the very outset, you know, with this very early move um, to uh, New York and the first works that explore this 
foundational tension between the stillness of her being in bed and the kind of the constant mobility of the camera in a way, not how, how, no matter how slow. Um, but this and, and this kind of rootlessness, this this nomadic instinct or this nomadic uh, impulse, um, you know, to me is in a way also for formative of like one of the most important um, cultural events to have befallen both art and film culture in the last uh, 30, 40 years, which of course has to do with the fact that, you know, sometime in the 80s and the 90s, a certain kind of crisis occurred in 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 the film in in, in the field of kind of film culture, which uh, led to the gradual expulsion of a certain kind of art, cinema to the museum, right? Um, and in a way, um, Chantal Ackermann, and you know this is a um, desk the installation desk from nineteen ninety three. It's it's the same year that Douglas Gordon um, first shows twenty four hour cycle. Um, it's the year that uh, Matthew Barney releases Crim Master 2, I believe. Um, it's the year that Stan Douglas, uh, uh, Gary Hill, and other people, other artists like them, basically kind of, you know, build this very dominant paradigmatic model for contemporary art in the 90s as cinematic. Um, um, you know, kind of the early 90s are, in a way, in, in the global art field, are, are marked in a deep way by the darkening of the white cube to become black boxes for cinematic experiences. And Chantal Akmaran is one of the first filmmakers to kind of make that, you know, jump, uh, leave the cinema behind, in a way, uh, out of a sense of dissatisfaction, obviously, and, and head for the new comfort of the museum. And, and it's that... That, that transition or that jump or that leap, if you, watch, if you wish, that we were interested in kind of mapping out in this exhibition. Um, but it's a jump in a way that never, that perhaps was never really kind of fully or, or executed with, with, with kind of the full confidence of, uh, of someone, um, you know, trained to work in the museum, in, in, inside a museum. Because that was actually one of the, one of the most telling impressions I got from working <clears throat> with Chantal that she really didn't understand the museum space. You know, it was clear that, you know, Dest was conceived as a, a, a visual event that had to be experienced in this kind of setting, and that she was in a way kind of talked into becoming a, uh, an artist, a visual artist or an installation artist. Um, she never really kind of knew what to do with the museum, even though she longed for it, even though she understood that um, you know, cinema as a space was no longer home in a way, right? That you know, home um, or a shelter or a shelter or a roof above um, her artwork's head was to be found somewhere else. Um, and um, but you know, and and this in a way I think was part of the um, the tension in working with her, of course. You know, like here's somebody. Um, a great filmmaker who doesn't necessarily know how to what to do with her work inside the museum that she agreed to be uh, in. Um, and the um, the first the, the the opening lecture of the series uh, was uh, an introduction to La Folie Almayer, um, which Vincent's. Uh, uh, Gave that film dates from 2011. It was released in 2011. So basically, it came out right in the middle of the process uh, of preparing um, the show at the museum in Antwerp. And I remember talking to her in 2010, starting to talk to her, uh, to, starting to talk to her in 2010, and kind of getting her on board this this kind of curatorial project. Uh, but as soon as it became clear that there was a film in the making as well, she would basically kind of drop everything. Um, curatorially or artistically or museologically um, to work on, on the film. So in a way, you know, this, that, it's the defining tension of her work in a way that she never really um, wanted to be nailed down as a solid, dependable inhabitant of either realm. This was a little bit my, um, kind of the crux of my experience. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask a couple of questions. Hotel Monterey, has this film been seen here? That's been shown here. Uh, still from Hotel Monterey, which is the second film she makes while living in, 
in New York. Uh, it uh, dates to 1972 as well. Um, again, a very kind of claustrophobic um, affair, this very, you know, kind of uh, uh, meticulous exploration of this interior space. Um, it's really hard, you know, kind of looking at Chantal's, uh, at Chantal's films, at many of Chantal's films, you could easily be lulled into the security of thinking that the outside world doesn't exist, you know. So there's, it's, you know, all internal in a way. There's this very kind of deep preoccupation with, with this, with the weak law uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of theatrical um, orthodoxy. Um, and this is something that I, that critically came back to haunt her. This 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 close, this uh, um, this kind of um, balancing act between you know claustrophobia, the claustrophobia of this experience, and the agoraphobia of the artist in a way. Because you know truly, um, if ever I met a, a more perfect example of an agoraphobic in the clinical sense, I I I, I wouldn't know. Um, Je tu il elle is a film from 1974, which in which she features herself. You know, can again hear um, a, you know just a random still. Um, most of the film uh, unfolds inside a very sparsely um, adorned bedroom, um, and this is of course um, you know the classic that forever established her reputation as one of the most important uh, filmmakers of the post-war uh, era. <clears throat> Um, uh, Jean Dillman, uh, 23, Quai du Commerce, 1080, Brussels. Um, who came to introduce that film? Eva Kuhn. Eva Kuhn. Um, I'm not sure if she would have mentioned this, but there is no such address. This address doesn't exist, right? There is a 23 Quai du Commerce in Brussels, but it's 1,000 Brussels. 1,080 Brussels does not have... Um, Quai Commerce. And I mean, this is just a silly anecdote or, or, or you know, nitpicking, but there's something uh, kind of telling in her uh, playing out this, this, uh, this dubious, uh, um, this confusion um, in that, I mean, this is also a little bit, uh, it's just kind of wordplay. Um, because of course, kind of you know, the point of the address is the very solid identification of where you are, where you live, where one resides, and the fact that her most famous film is uh, given this kind of fictitious address um, has interesting ramifications for the idea of the address that she herself explores in her films. Right? Um, you know, the audience is the addressee of of a, of a film. <clears throat> And actually, this reminds me of something that I have to uh, just share. It's a personal, um, just a personal reminiscence. Um, after the the show opened, Chantal's the 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 the, the, the survey show in Antwerp opened on the February the twelfth, two thousand twelve, and on the fourteenth of February, Saint Valentine's Day, I was on a plane to my new home, to Chicago, to never return to Belgium, really. It sounds dramatic, but uh, I have been back, but not uh, long ever. And so, um, so it was kind of a very abrupt farewell to this project that I had worked on for two years. And, um, and um, I wasn't in touch with Chantal much after that. And one of the things that, you know, you just have to know about her in a way, and it matters for looking at certain films, and it matters perhaps for understanding No Home Movie. Um, uh, you know, towards the end of her life, she was a social media obsessive. She was completely addicted to, I mean, she led half of her life on Facebook. Um, and um, I was a subscriber to Facebook at the time, but not a user of its communications uh, channels much. Um, and I remember kind of seeing these messages coming in from Chantal when I was living in Chicago already. Um, this is 2013. And some of them were quite uh, heartbreaking. She's kind of, you know, Dieter, why don't you answer my emails? You're not in touch with me anymore. You know, like, what did I do anything wrong? Stuff like that. Um, quite painful. So, you know, my last memory, living memory really of Chantal is her <laughs> sending an email kind of not crying out for help, but, you know, certainly trying to reestablish contact, which I, you know, somehow uh, didn't do. Um, she was teaching at the, the City University of New York at the time. You know, I was in, 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 in Chicago, so there was this assumed proximity spatially. Um, so, you know, just this notion of um, you know the double notion of address as kind of you know the 
formal identification of a solid point in space, but also um, the um, um, how to address someone, you know, how to reach out to, how to... Um, News from Home is a film from 1976, which I'm sure was also shown, um, which, you know, the narration is that of um, Chantal's letters to the home front in Brussels and the letters that she received back from home, News from Home, which were mostly those written by her mother. <clears throat> um, Toute une nuit from 1982. Um, the bed, you know, the bedroom, the very sparsely adorned bedroom. The phone also. Um, she loved calling. This is Golden 80s. This is a, a production, um, uh, uh, a shot of, uh, of, of the uh, production of Golden 80s from 1986, which doubtlessly also figured in the program. Um, who was the introducer there? Ferina Mund. Ferina Mund. Um, they would probably have told you that this film was shot inside the small shopping gallery in Brussels where her father had a leather goods store. Um, so, you know, never, uh, never really kind of uh, leaving home behind in a way. I mean, a truly Freudian mess. Um, <clears throat> that's a beautiful shot of, you know, Chantal at work and, you know, Chantal on the phone. This is kind of shot during the, uh, shot during the, the making of Golden Ladies, which, you know, is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful movie. Um, it was shot in 1986, released in 1986. It's meant to be a mirror of its time, but already at the time it felt like an incredibly nostalgic exercise in looking back at the time that she was in, you know. Um, and this is a shot from um, Dest. Um, you know, again, um, kind of this, inter this interior space, this feminine space. Um, um, I mean, it's not exactly a kitchen, um, but it has the trappings of one. And, it, you know, um, when I worked on, on the show and I kind of learned about the prehistory, kind of the intellectual uh, uh, genesis of, of this, I, I uh, um, learned from her that she initially set out in 1991, traveling um, behind the Iron Curtain <clears throat> out of some kind of weird sense of... Um, longing to reconnect with, you know, kind of the ancestral homeland. Because, of course, Chantal Ackermann was the child of Polish Jews. Her mother was a, a, a Holocaust survivor who spent years in Auschwitz. Um, <clears throat> she was originally from Tarnów, small, kind of a mid-sized provincial town in, in Poland, a couple of, you know, 100 kilometers east of Krakow. And so in 91, when she kind of started developing the idea for this, um, um, kind of the first generator, in a way, was a poem by Anna Akhmatova, um, which, you know, in the process of shooting this film was completely lost as a trigger. Um, but it's kind of interesting to know that it started with a Russian poem um, and that you then kind of, in that film, return every now and then to these scenes set inside, um, you know, these very private, these very kind of cramped um, private um, um, spaces, which, of course, at the time, um, you know, for much of the post-war period in Soviet culture was the home of poetry. You know, the kitchen was the home of poetry. It's where Josef Brodsky would, you know, first kind of address, again, his his readership. He'd have people come over to his apartment in Leningrad and have them listen to his poems in the kitchen. You know, he'd be reading those poems in the kitchen. Um, you know, the world kind of writing or, or publishing platforms weren't as available or not as not as inviting, in fact. Uh, so there's this idea, in a way, that kind of runs through this filmography, also as uh, of the kitchen, not just as a as a as this you know kind of um, private cocoon, but also this this space of creation, <clears throat> of uh, artistic uh, um, uh, exchange. Um, La Captive from two thousand, which was also shown in the program. Um, which, you know, a lot of it actually is shot outdoors. Um, one of the most kind of gripping parts, one of the most gripping scenes in that, uh, in that um, 
in the movie is, is this scene in which you know um, uh, a person you know the person the protagonist is following the woman um, very kind of um, again obsessively uh, but you know it's a very telling choice of imagery for the film poster right I mean this is what basically has to communicate the basic idea of the exhibition uh, of the of the of the film a film called the prisoner so you know kind of hinting at this very um, deep um, ongoing preoccupation with uh, entrapment as the condition of uh, of, uh, of artistic genius, you know, uh, entrapment as uh, or you know the prison that you basically kind of choose to make your home in, or the home that you choose to make into a prison. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a still from a film from nineteen ninety nine. Uh, from the other side, is that it? Yes. Uh, which um, was that part of? Did you? That's the one that was two weeks ago. Oh, okay. So two weeks ago, this film was being shown. It's kind of you know some experimental, uh, durational uh, documentary performance, if you can call it that. And you know, those of you who were there for that film maybe remember this particular um, scene or this still. Stop the crime wave. Our property and environment is being trashed by invaders. Um, it's amazing to think that this is 1999 and not 2018, because of or 2019, because of course it's all that American life in, in 2019 seems to be about, right? The border. Anxiety around the border, um, you know, fear of invasions, uh, fear of invaders, fears of the stranger, fears of the alien, xenophobia. Um, but also just kind of the plight of of the migrant, uh, the plight of the exile, um, and it would be in poor taste. This is a you know an image of a of a um, a Mexican a young man, probably Mexican, who's trying to make it across the border, you know, to make it into the promised land, which it still perhaps was more convincingly advertising itself as back in the day in 1999 not 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 anymore um <clears throat> and of course it would be kind of poor taste to compare the tragedy of someone's life like this with the uh, with the formal ideas of exile as kind of a driving force in Chantal's work but you know surely she was drawn to these stories um in part by their by the meaning that they had for her own thoughts about homelessness and belonging and you know being at home somewhere and 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 rootlessness and and uprootedness uh, you know one of the reasons why perhaps she was never that comfortable receiving me in her house in her home in, in Paris is because it was exactly that her home which you know is uh, um, a world that she wasn't so keen on sharing, perhaps. Um, this is a still from a very... This, I think, is a very important uh, kind of pivotal moment in her filmography. This is 2006. I should uh, wrap up. I'm almost there. Um, and I'm kind of moving towards the point in a way of the title as well. So this is a uh, still from La Ba over there, which I'll once again look at my hosts, was also shown and introduced by... Lalif Melamed. Lalif um, So... This is a film that was shot in its entire in its entirety inside a an apartment building in uh, inside an apartment in Tel Aviv, and um, not in its entirety. There were outdoor shots. There were outdoor shots. Um, I haven't seen it since it came out in two thousand six. Thanks for reminding me. Um, but um, you will agree that these uh, images are quite uh, uh, representational of the kind of crucial dynamic of of the film which is basically you know um, a big part of which it consists of uh, um, the soundtrack is, is you know um, again Chantal on the phone uh, calling her mother calling family members or friends and, and you know this idea of this very um, anxious lifeline to the outside world which she is uh, in some way uh, unable to really kind of engage very deeply um, I mean really it's kind of a filmic monument of agoraphobia again um, <clears throat> and I remember uh, talk, you know, seeing this film and being blown away by it um, though my memory uh, seems to um, 
uh, proof uh, the opposite. But um, being blown away by it and talking to a, um, a, a kind of a a colleague of mine at the time who basically found it an incredible, like an unbearable exercise in navel gazing, um, which of course you know it probably also was. Um, and and but the the opinion of this person basically kind of uh, was drew the classic arc of okay yes Jean Dielman this uncontested monument and ever since then you know the slow demise of this of this uh, of this creative genius which is a, an arc that I'm that I at no point was ever interested in really um, uh, kind of endorsing um, and. Um, But the fact that she cannot leave this apartment in Tel Aviv, um, you know, it's the first film that in which uh, Jewishness and Jewish identity become so incredibly emphatically um, thematized. And, you know, it's the point in which um, the increasing awareness of uh, Chantal Ackermann of herself as a Jewish artist um, Kind of uh, um, inflates the, the 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 concerns of of uh, of uh, you know this kind of nomadic life, this nomadic fate, which of course kind of come together very dramatically in this, in uh, in the last film. Um, I see that I'm being probably being admonished to kind of speed up a little bit. I will do exactly that. We're pretty we're there. Um, homelessness. Um, I mean, this is a film that in which she kind of most explicitly addresses also the story of her mother's life, uh, which, you know, is this traumatic story of Holocaust survival. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the implied impossibility afterward, after that um, to ever be at home anywhere at all. So there's just never any way for someone like Chantal Ackermann to make a home movie. Thank you. You speculated that um, people may not feel like talking about after this film, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I will say something, though. Uh, or if you have something to say, just go ahead. Well, I don't feel like talking, but I, I'll, I'll have something to say for sure. Um, I mean, there, there are various ways of, of watching this film, and one of them, of course, is to map it onto earlier uh, Ackermann films like the 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 way the, uh, we you know progressively build the model of the apartment and and learn about the topography of the apartment obviously is reminiscent of Jean Dillman the dramaturgic arc ending with a death is similar uh, the kitchen is a, a key space. Um, I was also thinking, as I was listening to your talk, and uh, you you specifically mentioned the kitchen. I was thinking of Joyce, who wrote Ulysses in a kitchen in Trieste, while his kids were playing around him. Uh, so somebody should do a history of the kitchen as a creative, as as a studio space or a creative space. Um, um, And another connection I was making as, uh, as I was watching is the connection to Laba, the, the film about Tel Aviv. The, the way, as you said, almost claustrophobically, it's the, the paradigmatic ag agoraphobic film, if you will, somebody who doesn't like to go outside and then, you know, only does so when it's in a way safe and in a space where there aren't a whole lot of other people. Um, one of the interesting things to me about Laba was the role that the balconies played. You know, you had a lot of pictures of empty balconies and then suddenly some, somebody appeared on a balcony and it was a big thing. Uh, and there are balconies in this film as well. Uh, so just the, 
the experience of those spaces is a, is a very powerful thing. Um, I have a very simple question. The landscape shots, what are they? I don't know. I, I um, It looks like the the water uh, were kind of... Uh, I, I don't know. So mm. I, I maybe somebody in the audience does. Um, <clears throat> it looks like she's looking at the Dead Sea. Yeah, it looks um, like Israel. Um, it is Israel, that it is Israel, much I know. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know where um, yeah. um, she... Uh, I don't even know whether it was shot around the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, very shortly before she did the exhibition at... Uh, in Antwerp, she had a show in Tel Aviv, and and mm-hmm. uh, um, and she'd become a, a regular visitor of Israel uh, right. later in life, you know, as is so often the case with you know um, artists who, <laughs> um, yeah, we can re- rediscover something about mm-hmm. themselves. But uh, yeah, so basically, it's um, the nominal homeland, right? Mm-hmm. Which of course remains something that she doesn't ever get out of the car to really feel right yeah um in, in this film one of the things that i fa- found striking is is the treatment of of light and color uh as the image progressively moves towards very sharp um contrasts and and uh, dark shadows where ultimately the mother only appears as a silhouette and then you have the the strong inside outside contrast and the terrific shot when she goes out on the balcony and just stays on the white um and then the hard colors and and uh, again i mean this looks like it was all shot randomly but ultimately yeah. she she constructs an, a, a dramatic but also artistic and visual arc yeah. to create a powerful artwork I mean, what, this reminds me of something that I wanted to mention in the introduction, but <clears throat> I overlooked. And um, initially, and perhaps still, I was a little bit puzzled by the title of this festival, the invention of form, mm-hmm. because in a way, I think she's. Uh, um, well, I, you know, what I talked about in my experience of working with her was this, you know, indecision, which is something that she decided to embrace, right? Yeah. Um, she did not win, want to make up her mind about belonging to one world or another, um, and and so there's an interest in the in formlessness throughout her work. Mm-hmm. So I never really kind of thought of her as a master of form, or of kind not, of not a master but an inventor. Ma- well, an inventor, yes, exactly. It's a very important distinction. And um, um, but of course, if, when you see a, a film like this, you kind of understand, you know the incredible precision with with she makes these formal decisions and um and and which you know, kind of reminds me a little bit of the fact that you know her completely informal um uh just kind of amateur schooling in in art uh, took place in new york in the 70s with people like you almost make us but you know she was also kind of part of the of of this moment in the New York art scene that you know was kind of marked by people like Robert Morris and Vito Acconci, where you know anti form was the word of uh, like, was kind of like the the, the calling the, the battle cry of the moment. Um, so there's kind of like a radical um, disavowal of formalist principle um, that of course does not mean that she does not have this very strong con- aesthetic conviction of you know light and dark and you know, counter jour and staging and all that. So, uh, and yeah, I mean, obviously also um, this obsessive filming of self and surroundings, uh, uh, which, you know, in the digital age, of course, leads to miles and miles and miles of footage. Uh, well, not miles, days, uh, uh, because, you know, we don't have that same kind of uh, spatial record anymore because we no longer shoot film as a kind of, you know, this analog metric. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you kind of have this oceanic mass uh, on which she still superimposes this rigid, these rigid kind of formal decisions about inside and outside and, yeah. Yeah, to, just to clarify the 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 provenance of the title, uh, it's an oblique quote from a text by Babette Mongold, uh, where she says that when 
Chantal Ackermann came to New York and um, they joined up and started working together. Their their shared desire was to invent a new language and a new form that would allow them to break away from basically the patriarchal order of representation. Um, and the I mean uh, it, it's the, uh, that's one of the things that we've re- discussed here repeatedly. She's never generic. So yeah. in that sense, she's n- she's never formalist. But uh, I mean, one thing maybe we could bring up here is that Bobette Mongold, of course, was trained as a classical cinematographer, and she had she she worked professionally, and you know she mo- basically moved into experimental film because she couldn't get any jobs in France, which wasn't because she wasn't good, but it was because she she made everyone ner- nervous just by the virtue of, by by virtue of being a woman in a technical profession uh, so, so that's why she went to New York and, and became a, an experimental filmmaker um, and so the the and, and I, I think if you I totally agree that there's a strong element of formlessness but but then again you know just the timing of the shots sure. you know and and again the composition and um, uh, there's there's an enormous uh, inventiveness yeah. there, I would say. Yeah. I mean, of course, this uh, seeing this film again, um, we you know it was released in 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 2015, and by the time it hit the Belgian theaters, she was already dead because she, you know she had suicide. committed suicide and. Uh, um, only a couple of months after her mother died, you know, chronicled so <laughs> um, confrontationally in this in, in this in this film, and <clears throat> you know, she didn't want to live in a motherless world. And um, I haven't, yeah, it's been four years since I since I saw it, or a year and a half, something like that. And um, I was sitting there in the corner, and I had kind of meant to step out because I had some work to attend i've seen the film before and on my way here my wife um wished me best of luck um kind of sitting through it again and i should add that she's a jewish mother so she <laughs> knows what she's talking about and uh um um so you know it's just so, so incredibly riveting in all its eventlessness and and you know and in all its you know the brutality of just kind of life recorded you know 24 um, 7 <clears throat> and it made me realize that you know we miss Chantal Ackerman um, yeah I'm not sure if there's anyone who has anything to say at all do we have questions or comments from the audience? Um, yeah impressions please <clears throat> Excuse my bit English. Yeah, um, I wasn't so lucky to see many of the movies here, mm-hmm. but I could not uh, get along. Uh, I, yeah, I had to watch this movie yeah. uh, in comparison to the Letters from Home to the mm-hmm. New York movie. And so I got the, I mean, so it was my impression that in the New York movie, she was exploring the outside yeah. and the, the, the realm of the mother, the letters from home. So this space, it wasn't shown in the movie. Right. It was just present there via the letters. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, it was just like a little bit vice versa. Sure. She was exploring the inside, uh, the inside of the house, the connection to the mother, the relation to the mother, mother and the, the outside world. Mm-hmm. So the scenes from um, Israel and maybe I don't know if the one shot was from US. Yeah, it was like it was like strange. There was nothing to explore. It seemed yeah. to me a little bit like this. Mm-hmm. She w- wasn't stepping outside the car, for example. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so in the one movie, it was like exploring New York, mm-hmm. and the the realm of the mother. <laughs> it was like in the back in the back right. yeah. somewhere, and now it was like different and it was just so it, this was my interpretation of or my viewing of these both movies and maybe you would like to comment on this impression maybe it's totally wrong or there's some point or i don't know you know um no i mean obviously this is very well observed um 
And again, News From Home is another film that I haven't seen for a very long time. So, you know, aspects of it also slip my memory now. But uh, it's a celebration of New York, of course. Uh, and she's made many films that um, are very extrovert, um, you know, kind of often set in very harsh sunlight, actually. Um, you know, she made a, a South, was that movie also shown here, uh, which is yeah, basically Tim, Tim kind of... Tim Griffin talked about it. Yeah, yeah. her pay into the American South, which is, you know, sun-drenched, but also in its way violent. Um, but that's why I kind of briefly touched upon this notion of La Ba over there, the film she shot in this apartment in Tel Aviv in 2006. as pivotal. Um, it's kind of where she embraces her disinterest in the external in the outside world in a way which you know kind of of course kind of then inevitably leads to charges of solipsism and uh, you know Chantal Ackerman makes movies about Chantal Ackerman or about being Chantal Ackerman um, but you know as this film shows they are uh, they have no problem becoming these incredibly powerful statements about love which is in a way, what I mean, it's the it's the the mother <laughs> of all subjects for her in a way. And you know, if in the late in the in the, in the eighties, you know, if she kind of like touches upon, uh, or in the early nineties, if she ever touches upon uh, like a flirtation with mainstream cinema or kind of uh, um, canonical film history. You know, she's inter her interest clearly veers towards um, you know Douglas Sirk, uh, you know uh, melodrama, and, and and so I and and this is something that I want to. Uh, that's my my ultimate apology in a way for uh, for uh, Chantal Ackerman. You know, she is the poet of this. Um, uh, you have this love which is familial in this in this instance but not necessarily doesn't necessarily have to be in which kind of transcends in a way the anecdote of the outside world uh, and you know like look where we are i'm not sure if i'm in frankfurt at all you know we're in this space in the space that looks the same everywhere and you know is built for the love of images <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, your comment and your response, but also your talk shows something, uh, show another aspect of what uh, I think you were uh, pointing towards when you talked about formlessness. Um, in a way, uh, Ackermann's films speak to each other. And um, the, you know, you're constantly reminded of another film. That, that was the brilliance of your introduction where you sort of led us through uh, her entire biography again and made a very important point in the beginning, which is that her first film that she made at age 18 yeah. was already a masterpiece, a fully formed uh, film that is on par yeah. with everything that came later. Now, let's not forget that she was 25 when she made John Dillman, which is just amazing, yeah. you know? This is a, a young woman <laughs> who makes one of the great artworks of the second half of the 20th century, just like that. Um, and in a way, she never, you know, there are artists where you have, uh, you know, who find their voice at a certain point in their life or who then later drop off in the quality of their work. This is not the case here. Like, to the very last shot. <clears throat> yeah. She... She's at the same level, but also the works speak to each other, and in that sense, they're incomplete in that they're not fully rounded. I mean, Jean Dillon, you could say, is sort of a fully rounded masterpiece of world cinema and art, generally speaking. But even that film speaks to other films, and if you watch this film and then start thinking about uh, Jean Dillon again, it, they, they sort of also mutually enrich each other. Um, yeah. Yes, please. Good evening. Uh, I have a question um, with respect to your introduction, um, because you differentiated between film and movie, and you said it's a film, not a movie. So um, I would like to better understand. 
Yeah, what is that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, of course, um, it's uh, it's uh, a random but not meaningless distinction, and um, um, what can I say about this? Uh, yeah. Like I, I, I thought maybe movie uh, in your mind is something where m sort of seeming, seemingly more happens or something like this, per but I'm not sure. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I mean, obviously, the first or kind of the first plane of illusion is the idea of um, a movie as a source of entertainment and a film as perhaps the higher plane. Um, this is a very crude distinction. It is just so that, um, you know, I've worked in the U.S. for many years now. I live there now and, you know, my family is American. And uh, whether it's Ingmar Bergman or, um, or Bumblebee or, you know, the Fantastic Four, I don't even know anything about, well, you know, um, the Marvel Universe, one goes to the movies, you know, um, it's all the movies. Um, it's actually grammatically bizarre to American ears for one to go see a film. Uh, you know, my wife uh, makes fun of me for kind of talking about like, let's go see a film. Because of course, the, the, the assumption is immediately that we're going to go see something dreary, boring, art house European. Uh, so this is in a way kind of like the primary distinction. Um, and it's a crude it's, it's one. It's a geographical distinction. It's a geographical distinction, but it's also kind of, you know, um, like the idea of the auteur. Uh, you know, kind of the film director as an author is, you know, obviously a lie to this vision of um, film as an art form um, that tries to kind of emancipate from, you know, the entertainment complex, the entertainment industry complex to which the idea of the movie belongs. And this is a little bit what I meant. But uh, but uh, uh, Chantal Ackerman is also somebody who was interested in being part of the movies. You know, she there's a popcorn desire in her work, which is nowhere, you know, it's nowhere more magisterially deployed than in Golden 80s, I think, which is so self-consciously a movie, even though she's an author and an auteur and, a, you know, like she continues to be an, a, an icon of cinematic art who in a way kind of plays with the idea of making a movie as opposed to a film. So it's a meaningful distinction, but... You know, I've kind of used it somewhat randomly, but I, you know, I take it people understand that we did not see a movie. But I think it's it's an interesting project to trace the distinction through her work yeah. and to actually look at the films that sort of veered towards the yeah. the movies, yes. uh, of which Golden Eighties, of course, is the most brilliant example. But uh, one film, unfortunately, nobody picked, and we somehow didn't get a chance to screen is a couch in new york which is uh Ackermann's pain to the screwball comedy but it's also a freudian meditation and a tribute to new york so i think we should go back and watch that film and then see what she really thinks of, about yeah. movies <clears throat> i mean it for has stars too i mean it has william hurt and yeah yeah um, um Julie, Julie Julie Binoche, Binoche, yes, yeah. yes i mean yeah. yeah that's maybe the closest she'd ever come to to, to a mainstream to hollywood you know yeah. um I mean, I often think of it in terms of um, musical presence in uh, in the um, in her films. I mean, I think that you know her two uh, Chant Ackermann's two most attentive students um, are, belong to very different traditions. On the one hand, there's the Dardenne brothers, uh, the Belgian filmmakers, who you know did much to enrich um, the tradition of cinema verite of the 90s and, and, and noughties on the one hand. And then I think her second most influential or important student is Steve McQueen. Um, and looking, you know, if you've, we've seen this now and to then tomorrow, well, not tomorrow, perhaps it's a little <laughs> heavy, um, but to now very soon after go see Hunger again, Steve McQueen's kind of, you know, formal uh, cinema debut, um, is a very t there's like you know a lot to learn from the parallels and uh, and I, I I'm quite sure that Steve McQueen would acknowledge that debt very explicitly, um, but you know I was I remember first seeing a Darden movie years well film <laughs> um, years ago and the first thing that I that in a way struck me about it or what kind of set it apart as that other product was the absence of a soundtrack. There's no music. 
and there's no music in this film other than what comes out of the radio at some point and she insists that we should put it the absence of a quieter. score yeah the absence of a score there's no sound there's no strings to emphasize the dramatic like you know a rise in dramatic tension because you know what there's no strings in life when i um which is uh, you know a very simplistic way i often think about that can art you know the use of uh, sonic artifice as a as a distinctive feature right uh, um yeah yeah i was i was actually gonna yeah i mean there's there's a shot in the beginning of the film where we see the garden and the the the, the, the chaise long yeah. the, the chaise yeah. long which yeah. is sort of defunct and then there are all sorts of sounds and birds and other animals and it's actually that that is a score. It's just recorded. Yes, you know? yes, yes. And well, it becomes a score by virtue of the decision to edit it mm -hmm. the way they do it. Um, and the wind and the, yeah, and the car yeah, exactly. ride, of course, and, the first. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, actually, please. my comment to, would have been in this direction. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, and another like score element that to me really was uh, very. Uh, has uh, had a very emotional value in the film was the the sounds made by the mother so like this uh, kind of cough or like uh, noise that she was made making and uh, that in a way uh, when uh, like uh, become uh, m louder and louder like uh, or like it it had to me like a sort of dramaturgy this sound that she was making, so just want to say yeah. that, uh, yeah, in a way I mm, perceived that as a sort of score, even though not um, a sure. dramaturgically musical one, but um, I think to this respect, uh, it has a very interesting uh, soundscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the the sequence in which she mercilessly records her mother's coughing and wheezing and, you know, kind of the slow disappearance of her presence, you know. I mean, that's, uh, is, you know, it's ju just absolutely, <laughs> I mean, merciless, uh, cruel cinema. And it's what actually reminds me the most of uh, Steve McQueen. Um, I mean, this kind of, again, I mentioned visceral, like the notion of the visceral in the, in the introduction, and it's kind of what I refer to, this... Uh, um, you know, this unflinching looking, you know, uh, transience in the eye, which I think is uh, um, a work of sound more than image at that point, because of course her mother has become this invisible dark silhouette in a way. Exactly. I mean, yeah. the, the, I mean you can only hear her. I mean, she could, she could have gone up, she, she could have chosen to put the camera in a different position and to film her face, uh, but she doesn't do that. So, so the views of the mother correspond to the increasingly amorphous character of the sounds. And there's an element of alienation, so just the way the, the figure of the mother is traced through both sound and, and image and lighting in particular uh, is, is uh, yeah. And also in the scene, Amazing. the mother is sleeping and the snoring of the mother. This was also a scene that I found very uh, scandalous. Um, I don't remember much scenes in cinema with snoring people, like really snoring people. <laughs> and um, so it was part for me of this like uh, way of um, also uh, depicting the scandality of uh, old, uh, old elderly people in some way like um, um, yeah I don't know if the, the drama of trying to keep her awake yeah. and by, by the way I mean uh, in, in, in one shot there is uh, we see a, a frame photograph standing in one of the on a table, I think, of the mother, Chantal, and her sister. And then later, the sister talks about Chantal going to Venice and the mother can't remember that they went there last year or two years ago. And, and my inference was that that photograph shows them in Venice. Like the last time they were together, 
but so so there's maybe maybe it's just an artifice of montage. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah. But the that table in the dining room <laughs> yeah. is where the show in Antwerp kind of came into being. It's where really? yeah yeah no uh, I yeah. I spend you know every time I'd meet Chantal would have been would have been in that house always. The real scandal is that this film was uh, not as warmly received as it should have been uh, in in her kind of adopted, you know, New York. Um, and, I, you know, some people think it kind of uh, contributed to her general state of despair. The film? Yeah, well, the fact that it was mixed, that, mm -hmm. that, it's, re that its reviews were... Um, not as, yeah, I don't know, <clears throat> not as life-affirming as she would have hoped. Can you maybe uh, you, um, say a little bit more about the the uh, way the film was received then, uh, if you uh, have... Well, I, it's just some, I don't even remember who told me this, but uh, um, a friend, I mean, like a... a, a, like a, a a mutual acquaintance um, mentioned that, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the death of her mother was, you know, kind of the end of her in a way. <laughs> um, and, um, but, you know, this person basically kind of mentioned that this, uh, that this, yeah, that the, the, the somewhat um, uh, lukewarm reception of the, fi of the film in which she had clearly invested so much emotional energy, because this is, you know, a, a very draining uh, uh, confession in a way, right? And portrait of her mother in the fact that it was uh, received uh, not as warmly as she would have hoped to um, appears to have, yes, played a part in the steep downward curve of her, you know, uh, general mood. Um, yeah. She did not... She 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 opted <laughs> a I mean, cool as, way of stepping out. Yeah, as 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 little as I'm qualified uh, to tell you about this, but um, uh, as far as I know, she was very sensitive to reviews. She read everything closely and reacted very strongly, particularly to negative reviews. I remember uh, interviewing her for a couch in New York, and on the day the interview happened, uh, one of the Swiss newspapers had completely thrashed the film. And she knew about the text, and she was clearly very irritated. And she actually asked me about the journalist who'd written this and, and wanted to know more about him. Uh, and so I had to tell her, you know, yeah, I don't think he has a very good taste in film, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here's his address. <laughs> and here's his address. You can send someone his way. Uh, <laughs> but but it was very clear that she was very sensitive to what people wrote about her films and and reacted very strongly to it. She was, you know, another kind of like person. Most, most artists do, but in this case, I felt... No, no, I, she, I, you know, a personal memory I had of working with her... Um, <clears throat> On the exhibition is that you know, as an artist, I mean, this is also, of course, kind of the ambiguity of her position as a very um, highly regarded filmmaker, uh, but then also as you know, a visual artist who f operates in the global contemporary art field, and she was represented. Her work still is being shown by Marion Goodman Gallery in New York and Paris, which is one of the most you know kind of revered and powerful um, galleries in the world in in the world. But you know, also. Um, she had, uh, um, yeah, kind of a chip off on her shoulder about being um, perhaps not the most central presence in the gallery stable. Um, she often complained about, you know, all of the attention that Marion would lavish on artist X, Y, or Z, you know, kind of the well-paying painters. Um, and she was particularly peeved that Marion Goodman did not come down to Antwerp for the opening of her show. <laughs> yeah, sensitive. Yeah, loving. Right. That's probably it, no? Okay. All right. It's July 11th still. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's... For another two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes, minutes. Two minutes away from, from um, 
Yeah, I think it's a Belgian holiday of some sort. So, adieu, Chantal. All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Steve. Thank and thank you. <laughs> and again, I think uh, everyone agrees that we could just start over and go back and watch all the films again. Well, you know, Salt Maville. Yeah, come on yeah, the yeah. July come 20th back. and uh, at 6 p.m. We're going to show Sotmaville and you can see a little bit more of Chantal. And thank you so much, Dieter, for this amazing talk um, and for bringing us the film. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, we'll start again with the lecture series in October. So stay tuned in our program with the new semester. Which, thank you. By the way, we'll be uh, dedicated to Zhao Zhangke, the most important contemporary Chinese filmmaker.